I'm James Anderson. Welcome to the fourth episode of my podcast, Music is Just the Word. so happy that you've joined me for this fourth episode. Seems like the length of these episodes is creeping upwards, so I just thought I would mention, if you're finding this to be a bit of a dense podcast, there's really nothing wrong with listening to it just a few minutes at a time. Full disclosure, a few minutes at a time is exactly how I record it. In this episode, we are deepening our investigation of language, observing the dominant and often invasive nature of language among human communications in general. And we're going to do this both in the context of music and aside from music. Most human communications are not language, although really that depends on the human. Language is just one kind of narrow category of communications involving the naming of things. What kinds of things? All sorts of things can be named, from objects to moments to experiences to human behaviors. Language is kind of a poster child for human communication, There's a lot of times someone will say communication and they really don't mean anything other than language. And so remembering the broad spectrum of communication outside of language is kind of like remembering that most of the tree of life is not even multicellular organisms. When we think of what life is, we tend to see images of plants and animals. But the most abundant organisms on Earth by far are the prokaryotes, consisting of only one cell, which doesn't even have a nucleus. Similar to how these tiny, ancient, and very numerous organisms are what make up most of the tree of life, I'm here to make the point that the spectrum of human communication is much more characterized by tiny, ancient, and very numerous communications, and a much more varied array of communications than someone would realize if all they cared about was language. Anatomically modern humans are only about 200,000 years old, meaning before about 200,000 years ago, people didn't quite look like the people of today. They weren't quite built the same. I've often wondered, just how old is anatomically modern language? How long has language been around in more or less the same form that we hear it in today? One of my favorite authors, Yuval Harari, states that storytelling emerged 70,000 years ago, But another author that I'm reading, the linguist Daniel Everett, pushes storytelling farther back than that, saying that Homo erectus were in all likelihood storytellers themselves. Either way, this is only spoken language. Written language, on the other hand, is probably no older than the agricultural revolution, which started about 10,000 years ago. So to make a long story short, language is very, very young in the grand scheme of things. If we're taking a long step back and looking at the earth from a big history point of view, Language has only really been around for the briefest moment. Language might be endowing us humans with superpowers among the species of Earth, but it is really still just an experiment, an experiment that hasn't yet completed much of a trial. All things considered, this really isn't the same world as it was before language came along. There are many important things to observe about language's rise to power. And of course, the story of language's rise to power is not distinct from the story of culture in general and the story of humanity's ascent from just another insignificant little ape species to the rulers of the planet. Language is a big part of what makes Homo sapiens what we are. This podcast in general is my attempt to expose the unfamiliar and alien nature of language in the big picture. I feel that it's important to do this because in the small picture, in our everyday lives, language is so common, so ever-present and ubiquitous, that it's basically invisible and very easy to take for granted. What do you think about when you think about runaway cultural evolution? Some of the common themes in our literature and our dystopias include simulations, singularities, and machine apocalypses. 
But all of these hallmarks of runaway cultural evolution have already begun in subtler and more familiar forms than what we depict in our stories. The most quintessential example of this is language. Actually, perhaps there's an even more quintessential example of runaway cultural evolution in the form of arms races, which are really the epitome of culture's potential of being fatal to humans. But you know, it's nothing other than language that we use to decide whether or not to deploy our most destructive weapons. Drop the bomb. Don't drop the bomb. Drop the bomb. Don't drop the drop bomb. Drop the bomb. Even though language is only one group of communications within a much broader spectrum, and even though language is so very new in the grand scheme of things, language seems to have situated itself at the center and the top, kind of the control tower of all human communications. Attempts to influence human behavior can be found everywhere through culture, and their most common and most available form is talking. We seldom stop to remark how unbelievably synonymous language is, particularly oral language, with the influence of human behavior. You can hardly talk at length without influencing human behavior. You can hardly influence human behavior without talking. It might be true in a broader sense that to talk about anything is to have some kind of influence on it, or at least to set the groundwork to one day influence it. But when talking about human affairs, language is almost guaranteed to have some appreciable effect. The great influence that language has over human behavior in general is all the more stunning when we stop to remember that language is a human behavior. If human behaviors are like genes competing for certain positions on an organism's genome, then surely the language behaviors are the ones that have rigged the system in their own favor, sometimes to the detriment of the other competitors. In The Selfish Gene, Dawkins says, The effect of any one gene depends on interaction with many others. Some genes act as master genes controlling the operation of a cluster of other genes. So if we're running with memetics and we're giving a chance to this comparison between genes and the behaviors comprising human culture, I think we need to point out that among human communications, language behaviors are very often in these master positions. A single word or phrase can enable or disable great groups of communications to follow, whether or not they are obviously linked. could take this comparison a step further for the biology nerds and compare language to something like a segregation distorter. This is a fatal gene unleashing a meiotic drive, which aids in the replication of the gene itself, but sometimes wreaks havoc on the rest of the genome and its associated organism and species. In more general terms, we call this kind of thing a genetic disease. Could we say that language is a memetic disease? Well, of course, disease is a relative term, and humans have certainly formed symbiotic relationships with languages. For a long time, humans have promoted the growth and the prosperity of languages, and the integration of language into society. Today, there is virtually no part of society that is not directed or coordinated or influenced in some way by language. Ask people what the most important category of human behavior is, and many will doubtless say that it's language. Indeed, language is what allows us to manage many of the activities that have led to our unprecedented dominance on this planet. On the other hand, language, as well as the rest of human technology, could end up being fatal for humanity in one way or another. If the replication of human behaviors and human communications is anything like genes, then we need to ask, what are the relationships between replicators in either of these systems, and what influence does any given replicator have over the next? If the competitors in question are human communications, then there's a wide array of effects that one replicator can have over the next that might not have a parallel in the biological world. With language, you can have behaviors about behaviors. There's nothing like this with genes. This points back to the big disanalogy between cultural evolution and biological evolution. For all that there might be similarities, for example with universal Darwinism and the meme gene analogy, 
The major disanalogy is between the origins of life in the absence of any kind of intelligent designer and the origins of culture in which cultural replicators had to be selected by intelligent humans or slightly proto-humans. With human culture, there has been an emergence of completely new ways for replicators to relate to one another. And specifically what I'm talking about is reference, representation, symbolism, signification, and meaning in general. For behaviors that already compete together in an evolutionary pool the way genes do, the introduction of a thing like symbolism is very important and can't really be overemphasized. With symbolism, one replicating human behavior can be about another replicating human behavior. Communicating exasperation or annoyance by staring directly upwards with one's eyes. This is a stable pattern of communication that replicates with enough consistency that people tend to get the message. The spoken phrase, rolling one's eyes, or the similar phrases that you'd be more likely to hear in a real life context, don't roll your eyes at me, or who are you rolling your eyes at? These verbal communications replicate at any opportunity, just the same as the communications that they are about. The pattern of a symbolic behavior like a word or phrase can carry information about the behavior that the words symbolize. Through this unique form of cultural reference, one chain of replicators can effectively be absorbed into another chain of replicators. And this is something that might not have a parallel in the biological world because genes are not about genes, at least not in the same way that communications can be about communications. There might actually be an indirect comparison we can make to biology with predation and organisms consuming each other. Now that so many of the behaviors made by a given human are symbols, behaviors aren't just competing to be used instead of each other. In a way, behaviors are now competing to contain each other. When language is symbolizing other human behaviors, it's intuitive to think of the language as furthering these behaviors. Things like preparation and planning and education, these things often involve verbal symbols aiding the behaviors that the symbols are pertaining to. But there might be something else at play, something a little bit deceptive. With symbolizing behaviors and symbolized behaviors all competing together in the same overall evolutionary pool, symbolism might not be a zero-sum game. As I'm going to argue, what we have now with the invasion of language into every domain of human behavior is symbolic behaviors, particularly language, replicating at the expense of the behaviors they symbolize. Humans have all kinds of purposes for which we employ language. But to language itself, the purpose is singular. Make more language. Communications compete to become more numerous in the overall evolutionary pool of communications. This is very similar to how the genes of a species are competing to become more numerous in that species' gene pool. Language has a major competitive advantage over the other communications. Being a sign system, language is able to symbolically refer to other kinds of communications in ways that those other communications cannot do in return. Language communications are able to replicate so abundantly in part because they're able to refer to or symbolize musical communications as well as all the other families of communication. There doesn't seem to be a limit on how much language can replicate on account of how little music. There also doesn't seem to be a limit on how discordant the language can be and how much strife it can cause. Since we're working with the assumption that human behaviors are competitive replicators, Herein lies a sort of a pre-existing evolutionary conflict of interest, because if ever a group of behaviors did emerge that could symbolize a vast array of things, then among this vast array of things to be symbolized would naturally be other human behaviors. To help me make this point, I'm going to quote a couple of my favorite authors. People are keenly sensitive to social status, judgment, and competition. Unlike most animals, people are not only born absolutely helpless, but remain so for years. We only survive by getting along with family members and others. Social concerns are not optional features of the human brain. They are primal. That's a quote from Jerome Lanier's latest book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts Right Now. Now here's a quote from Yuval Harari, who I mentioned earlier in the episode. 
Even today, the vast majority of human communication, whether in the form of emails, phone calls, or newspaper columns, is gossip. That's from Harari's most famous book, Sapiens. It's intuitive to think of languages as these kind of boundless blankets of knowledge that can symbolize basically anything. And I guess they kind of can symbolize basically anything on Earth or off of Earth. But we don't know this about the origins of language. The origins of languages might very well have been very particular and very specific. Other than calls to indicate danger and threats, for an ancient human, there's really nothing more pressing to be able to symbolize than human behaviors. With the emergence of symbolism, we need to keep in mind that a great many of the earliest and most urgent things for human behaviors to be able to symbolize were likely other human behaviors. If there's any one thing that has been more thoroughly named than anything else, it's probably human communications. Language and symbolism are just a category of communications within the whole spectrum, but they are evolving into ever more wide-ranging, ever more specific, and ever more detailed roles of representing communications. Language and symbolism is the one group of human communications that could potentially, feasibly encompass all human communications. The contained becomes the container. <laughs> 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 Even in the modern world, think about how much of what we say is about human behavior, and think about how much any particular human behavior can be talked about at length. Since we the symbolizers are naturally predisposed to be thinking and caring largely about ourselves and each other, and what we're doing and what behaviors people are making, I suggest that if there's any one thing that has been more thoroughly represented in syllables than anything else, it's probably human behaviors. Communications are evolutionarily adapted to influence each other's chances of replication, and this is probably much older than symbolism and language. This merely follows from recognizing communications as replicators. Now, with language and symbolism, this same influence that has always existed among communications reaches a whole new level of refinement, where a group of language behaviors can effectively contain a catalog of perhaps thousands of behaviors, language and otherwise, along with all the other things that can be named. Once the naming systems that are languages are able to name a wide variety of behaviors, these behaviors can now be referenced by humans through the use of words. This can take many exact forms. The most obvious form of verbal influence over behavior, of course, is giving people instructions, naming a behavior that you want someone to do, but also commentary, observations, questions, scolding or congratulating, and so on. Whether it's talking about your desired actions from a person or naming the actions you observe from that person, it's basically the same one-way influential relationship between your words and that person's actions. Music is just power. Here's the philosopher Daniel Dennett to talk about the power of language from another angle. What makes language a potent medium for the transmission of information is that it's digitized in the same way that DNA is digitized. It's composed of fundamental elements. In the case of DNA, it's A, C, G, T, four different nucleotides. In the case of language, it's 20 to 30 phonemes. I just love this kind of comparison between DNA and language. And of course, what Dennett is comparing is modern DNA with modern language, both of which had to go through long, gradual evolutionary processes to become their current digitized selves. We are designed to pick up the phonemes of our native language and then automatically to categorize incoming utterances by correcting them to the norm of whatever the phonemes in our language are. And it doesn't matter whether I say dog or dog or dog. It all comes out as dog. It doesn't take any effort to recognize that these are all tokens of the same type. That's digitization. And that's what makes it possible to transmit information from one person to another to another. And the person in the middle doesn't have to understand what it means. All they have to do is copy the sequence of phonemes and the message will get through. For a system like culture that is already based on a copying process, we really can't overstate the significance of language. 
With language, we have the emergence of a digitized copying process, still more or less in its infancy, that is already assimilating a wide range of the other copying processes involved in culture. Processes that probably at one point stood quite independently of language. One of the themes that Dawkins talks about in a later edition of The Selfish Gene is the evolution of evolvability. This topic concerns the evolution and gradual improvement of evolutionary systems themselves. Dawkins asks questions along the lines of, why do many organisms start out as a single cell, whereas others don't? Why is there sexual reproduction? These are very interesting topics for someone like me who's trying to understand language, because they illustrate how the immensely complicated systems of life could only have emerged from slightly less complex systems that came before. The human body makes 300 billion new cells each day, and, possibly with a few exceptions, each of these cells contains a complete copy of the human's entire genome, which is a sequence of 3 billion pairs of nucleotides. Copying machinery like this doesn't just spring out of nowhere. In biological evolution as well as cultural evolution, there is a gradual transformation from the primordial soups of imperfect replication, eventually leading to highly formalized, highly digitized, and highly precise copying systems like we see with DNA. DNA might have taken billions of years to become what it is, but as we know, culture evolves many orders of magnitude faster not least of all because of humans' imperfect copying abilities, and consequently a much higher rate of mutation. So if we're considering culture to still be in its primordial soup of partial replication and imperfect replication, we need to be wary that cultural evolution may progress beyond this primordial soup the way biological evolution has. Thanks to biology, we know that evolutionary systems can evolve and gradually become more formalized, more digitized, and their replication processes can become increasingly precise. Cultural evolution could take off in any number of directions, directions that we might or might not understand, directions that we might or might not have any control over. And of course, we need to remember our natural niche as humans might very well be within a phase of cultural evolution that is in its primeval soup. A digitized mechanism of high-fidelity replication might elevate cultural evolution to its next phase, whatever that may be. But it might not be a good thing for humans. The evolution of the evolutionary mechanisms of culture to move past this primeval soup could end up transforming our lives and could end up destroying our lives. I'm sure that when most people hear the phrase runaway cultural evolution, it makes them think of arms races or perhaps AI or the singularity or maybe just an explosion of the human population. But let me tell you, what I think about when I think about runaway cultural evolution is nothing other than language. So let's take all the different kinds of communications we can think of. And you'll remember I was talking about very small and very ancient communications. So what I mean would be things like body language and facial expressions. And these would seem to make up a lot of the communications coming from a given person. But again, of course, this depends on the person. We tend to talk about emotions in our culture as states to be experienced inwardly by a person. Really though, what is an emotion but a communication? So we have emotional communications. Similarly, what is any sexual gesture but a communication? So let's go ahead and add sexual communications to the list. Competitive gestures that we would see in times of conflict, these are communications themselves. So competitive communications, what else? We have the communications that are laughter, the communications that are crying, we have musical communications, and of course the reason I'm recording this, we have the communications that are language and symbols. Additionally, I would like to consider the material aspects of human culture to also be communications. In contrast to the rest of the list, much of which included vocal communications, which dissipate into the air almost immediately, material communications, such as a handprint on the wall of a cave, can last for thousands of years after the death of the person that left the handprint. Appearing in a photograph is similarly a communication that can last for a long time. Could we even consider things like sculptures, tools, and buildings to be communications? 
I don't see why not. Someone could make the point that these are the artifacts resulting from the communications rather than the communications themselves. But let's not worry too much about semantics. The benefit of regarding communications as the genes of culture is that communications include such a wide range of permanence, from the fleeting sounds that we make to the material structures we make potentially lasting thousands of years. The longevity of communications is an important factor, especially if we're considering communications to be replicators. The longer a communication lasts, the more people can potentially witness it and the greater its audience will potentially be. Anyone familiar with behavioral ecology or ethology will know that animal signals partly evolve according to the receivers, the audience. Some of the signals that behavioral ecologists deal with are animals' behaviors, such as vocalizations, but other relevant signals can often include animals' physical body parts, like the famous peacock tail. So I've divided up all these categories of communication, and I've done so, of course, in a very subjective way, but it kind of helps to show language is just one kingdom of communication among many others. But because of language's special abilities, this particular kingdom of communications has absorbed something of a microcosm of several of the other communication kingdoms. Other people are bound to have different ways of classifying communications. And of course, my list is far from complete. But just to classify communications in this way, with language making up only one category, is in itself revealing of a deeper and subtler truth. We have different ways of communicating so, so that, that we, we can, can communicate, communicate different things. things. We have music because it allows us to express things that can't be expressed through laughter and language and the other kingdoms of communication. We have crying because it expresses something that only crying can. If you could fully translate any of these gestures into language and not risk losing anything in translation, then these other kingdoms of communication would basically be unnecessary. If music, and for that matter, all the other kinds of non-language communications, are just tools to generate more language, then what's the point of even having these other ways of communicating? Might as well just throw them all out and replace them with even more language. And while we're at it, we might as well eliminate all face-to-face -face contact, set up a virtual system for language communications, and put ourselves all to sleep in bio-tubes that can use the heat coming from our bodies to power the system. Now I'm going to get back to my point about symbolic behaviors, especially language behaviors, replicating at the expense of the behaviors that they symbolize. What might a field like memetics reveal about the overall relationship between musical communications and language communications? It's hard to imagine such disparate things as handprints on a cave wall or sculptures having much of a competitive relationship with syllables. But it's easy to imagine evolutionary competition between music and language. Especially considering singing, music and language use many of the same muscles and are competing to take up many of the same times in our lives that could either be designated as music time or as talking time. As replicators, music and language have much of the same spawning grounds, so we can consider them to be in more proximate evolutionary competition. The sole purpose of language behaviors is to signify things other than themselves. In contrast, purely musical gestures don't signify anything, and if they do, if an F minor chord can be said to signify or mean anything, that thing could only be F minor chords. Strictly musical behaviors are not symbols and cannot refer to or represent other human behaviors. They are presentations, not representations, presentations of nothing else than their own selves and maybe all the copies of their own selves. You can talk about music, but you can't music about talk. People who do make music about things, and music that symbolizes things, are only able to express this through words, whether these words happen to be in the music or around it. Musical communications are like a soil from which we grow so many kinds of referential and symbolic communications. Commentary, instructions, praise or criticism, monetary communications, all in the same one-way relationship to the music. They are about the music, while the music is not about them in return, because the music isn't about anything. It's just music. 
People talk about the music. People exchange money about the music. People take pictures of the music. People inscribe the music into notations and recording software. People demand certain musical behaviors. People prohibit certain other musical behaviors. People comment on conflicts of interest surrounding the music. All these different communications pertaining to the music are pointing to the music in ways that music cannot point back. Next to all these symbolic communications, musical gestures and performances in general are humble. They are an offering. They seem to say, here I am, this is me, talk about me, represent me. Humble as they may be, musical gestures and performances are the things with the actual substance, in contrast to language and symbolic behaviors, which are hollow in a way, solely existing to refer to other things. Musical gestures can often be very difficult to perform properly and can be very expensive in terms of the energy they require, especially if you include all the necessary practice. Communications about the music are often much cheaper and more universally available, and so from an evolutionary standpoint, it's easy to see how communications surrounding the music, referring to the music, could become more abundant than the actual musical gestures. Could there be limits to language about music becoming more abundant and music becoming less abundant? Well, if music were to disappear entirely, then it could no longer be the talk of the town, and so all these referential and symbolic behaviors would also disappear. Language would lose a significant avenue for replication. The musical communications and all the language communications surrounding the music have a really interesting relationship. It's not entirely competitive, and it's definitely not entirely cooperative. The best way I can think to describe this relationship is to say that music has become a vehicle for language. And this is just what replicators do. They establish machinery that serves to further their own replication. Genes, the OG replicators that have been at it for billions of years, make survival machines, in other words replication machines, of exquisite complexity, and we know these machines as biological organisms, plants and animals and you and me. If biological replicators can achieve this, then there should be little doubt that one class of cultural replicators, like language, could subvert and assimilate another class of cultural replicators towards its own selfish ends. And it could do this through the unique powers of symbolism and reference and representation that only language really seems to have. So it's not just a matter of asking which cultural replicators have gotten to be more numerous. It's also important to ask which cultural replicators are employing or enslaving which other cultural replicators. Other than machinery and vehicles, a good metaphor for this stuff would be livestock. <laughs> All of the animals that humans have domesticated have wild counterparts, whether we're talking about their wild relatives living today or their wild ancestors that lived prior to humans coming along and domesticating them. The animals that are able to flourish in an environment heavily modified by humans will be different, might look similar, but they will be different than the animals that would flourish in an environment without any humans. Likewise, the behaviors that can flourish in an environment heavily modified by language will be different than otherwise. As language behaviors become more numerous in the overall evolutionary pool of human communications, all of the non-language communications that we make, facial and bodily communications, emotional, sexual, and competitive communications, etc., are all transformed as a result. These non-language communications gradually cease to be self-replicating communications, as we could compare to wild animals, and their success or failure to replicate becomes mediated by language and symbols, which makes a fairly clear parallel to farm animals who either reproduce or don't based on their utility to humans. <laughs> Within any of these non-language categories, communications that are prompted by language, or communications that we make towards a language-related purpose or end, begin outnumbering the non-language oriented and the non-language originating communications. And this happens in a similar way to how domesticated species begin outnumbering their wild relatives. So I'm basically saying that non-language communications have been domesticated, or are in the process of being domesticated, by language. 
Now, in the case of competitive behaviors, you might be thinking, thank the gods that we have language. It's pretty clear that chimpanzee society can only be so violent because they don't have language. If a chimp attacks another chimp, there's no way for the victim to go tell a story about it. If I go to someone's house and act like a chimp, there'll be stories about it that'll follow me around for the rest of my life. Mind you, when language interrupts combat, it's not always a neat and orderly scenario of people being held accountable for their actions. Sometimes what you get is multi-person pile-ups and just a big mess of shouting. Often what happens is the competition simply leaves the physical world and now people are competing in an arena of words. <laughs> Let's think about laughing communications now. The versions of laughter that remind me of wild animals are when laughter seems to respond directly to circumstance or else just more laughter. Often the only thing that needs to happen for people to start laughing is just for someone to start laughing. Sometimes just thinking about laughter is funny enough to get you laughing. Wild laughter, freestanding laughter, is laughter that continues for minutes and minutes and there doesn't even have to be anything funny except for the laughter itself. So sometimes you can have a strong spirit of humor that doesn't require anything to be explained. And when there is explanation, it can often ruin the humor. By contrast, what we see with the formal institutions of comedy is an exchange of laughter for language. The laughter happens in response to precise jokes. And if you laugh at the wrong time, it can kind of be a subversive act and you might get in trouble for it. <laughs> hey asshole, that wasn't the punchline. Scenarios like these with domesticated, language-mediated laughter are gradually becoming more numerous at the expense of the laughter that grows wild and free. Where there is humor and laughter growing wild and free, it often has to contend with Ron Burgundy types who feel compelled to identify with language a source of the humor. And this is just one small piece of the greater pattern of language's invasion. As language permeates all through the behavior pool, it restructures interactions and relationships with itself as the foundation. Activities that one day stood independently of language, communications that were one day wild and freestanding, are now being assimilated into the representational spheres generated by language and reference and symbols. So what does all of this mean for music? Music that is unaffected by language can sometimes keep going all day and all night. In a music culture where the music is always ending after three and a half minutes, is it ending for any other reason than to make way for talk? Much of the music a person hears through the day comes in brief commercial length segments. Instagram length music performances are a great example. Many musicians are focused on putting these out as well as singles, and meanwhile, full albums as a format of musical expression seem to be all but dead. In short, our music keeps stopping. And I don't think it's mere coincidence that pretty much any of the music I've been involved in, at least in a formal way, has really just seemed like a platform for people's language, whether in between the songs or as part of the song. Something I kind of glossed over last episode, a music culture dominated by language, is that much of language's invasion of music is happening from within, in the form of lyrics. I've heard that in powwow music, songs with lyrics in them have a special name, word songs. For much of non-powwow music, the word song basically implies that there will be lyrics. Non-lyric driven music seems to be turning increasingly rare and seems to occupy somewhat of a niche market. I don't think it would be possible today to get a song on the billboard charts without lyrics. Much of lyrical music these days seems to be driven by quantity of lyrics, not to mention the speed of the lyrics rather than quality. Lyrics or otherwise, language controls the music by stopping it, analyzing it, and in general by promoting the presence of language-centric, language-serving music at the expense of the wild kinds of music, the kinds of music that flourish in language's absence. Three and a half minute pop songs? 10 second long music reels for social media? How about instead, we see how long we can make music last? You might think to yourself, because all the language is about the music, the music is still winning. Well, let me debunk this. When the highest percentage of the talk is about the music, this is precisely when the music behaviors are most dramatically outnumbered by the talking behaviors. 
Compare a typical open mic or open stage event to a drum circle. If you measure the amount of music coming out of the speakers at an open stage and compare it against the amount of talk coming out of the speakers, it might be a decent ratio, but the music is only coming from a very few people at a given time. So if you actually count up how many people are present and you actually count up a total of person hours being spent on talk versus music, the ratio isn't looking so good anymore. Typical open mics and open stages involve a very small amount of actual musical contributions and a great many non-musical contributions offered in response to the music, mostly along the lines of language, but if you're lucky, people will be dancing and singing along. At a drum circle, there's less talk about the music by far, and if there is any talk about the music, you usually can't even hear it, which is significant. And there's far more person hours being spent on music as opposed to language, because at a drum circle, it's usually much closer to full participation. The special thing about something like Tam Tams in Montreal is that it's no one person's project and no one person is in charge of designing it. Nobody needs to introduce the concept to anyone. No person needs to single-handedly get things off of the ground. There's no master of ceremonies. It's just a public space, people casually gathered, everybody choosing their own level of involvement in an activity that is self-evident and needs no explanation. The industry side of music sometimes feels like the polar opposite of this. It can feel like people are seeing how much talk they can squeeze out of how little music. How many times can a single musical performance be leveraged and influenced by acts of announcement and recording and anticipation and planning and review and perhaps ownership and commerce and branding and advocacy and, and any number of things peripheral to the music as evidenced by drum circles in a harmonious musical gathering with majority participation there may be very little opportunity for non-musical contributions there may be very little opportunity for people to talk about the music Something that almost goes without saying is that a lot of the music industry and music culture in general is characterized by sometimes very discordant, non-harmonious relationships and interactions. Hunter S. Thompson actually has a funny quote along these lines. He says, The music business is a cruel and shallow money trench, a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. There's also a negative side. There was quite conceivably a time before language had infiltrated our music to the extent that we see today. It would be hard to compare how long language has been around versus how long music has been around, because both language and music are different today than they were in their infancy. So such a comparison might end up being between some kind of proto-language and some kind of proto-music, and this might not be much use to us. But what I can say is that if in the era when musical behaviors were first emerging, if the hominids of the time were surrounding the music with as much discordant, competitive, influential, manipulative language as we do today, music probably wouldn't have survived, and possibly neither would we. It's intuitive to see music as being beneficial to a group of humans, past or present, bringing cohesion, bringing harmony, improving people's relationships, and doing all of this through its uniqueness and independence as a non-language form of communication. But so often in the modern world, it seems that our music does the exact opposite. Any Stone Age benefits that music might have one day given us now seem to be in reverse isn't the power of music that it presents an alternative to the conflict and chaos and absurdity of our everyday lives. Shouldn't the importance of music be to offer an escape from these lives, however momentary, and an escape from the otherwise all-invading nature of language? So why does it so often seem that the music is actually generating all of this discordant language? I suggest we consider music not as a generator of talk, but as an alternative to talk. Music should be one of those things that we can do in those few and far between moments when we don't actually need to use language. Music should be something to do instead of making language. 
Like the other kinds of non-language communications, music should be a way of expressing the things that we can't say with language. But if language is latching onto music at every step of its existence, if language has leveraged its way into a position where the music is depending on it, and where the whole point of the music is to make more language, then is music really still offering any kind of escape from language? If I think I'm showing up to a freestyle music event, and it ends up being 10 minutes of introduction, analysis, and panel reactions for every one minute of freestyle, again, is music offering any real escape from language at this point? Or has language kind of defeated the purpose of music? Of course, with this runaway invasion of language happening, fields and activities besides music seem to involve a lot of the same dynamics. A good example for comparison would be the food industry, especially since we were just talking about livestock. So the world of food production and consumption, of course, is very heavily reliant on language, especially in the advertising. A lot of industry practices gone wild, a lot of monopolization in the food chain by big businesses. Not very many people in my North American culture feeding themselves anymore, nor are they particularly empowered to do so because of the way we manage property and territory in our culture. Small-scale farming just isn't viable for a lot of people. And I've recently heard a statistic that Canadians actually waste 60% of our food. Even if that stat happens to be incorrect, I think all my listeners should probably agree we do waste a heck of a lot of food. Of course, there's no singular culprit, and of course, there's no singular magic solution. But my singular thing to say about all of this is that it doesn't seem like our feeding behaviors have a very harmonious relationship with all the behaviors peripheral to the actual growing and eating of the food. The way we buy and sell food is probably a big part of how we waste so much of it. It's easy to see how the standardized, language-mediated portion sizes in restaurants can end up being the wrong amount of food for a given person, and next thing you know, half the meal's in the trash. Because of liability concerns and the threat of being sued, companies often have to discard their leftovers rather than giving them to hungry people or animals. Which is extra bad because it seems like it's always companies that have the food. I'm not going to add eating or growing food to my list of communication types, but I will point out that all human behaviors relating to food seem to be very similarly oppressed by our language and symbolic behaviors. Many, many people go hungry. And in principle, food could definitely be scarce. But in practice, food is not what's scarce. Not in my country anyway. In practice, the scarce things are the communications entitling us to the food. Communications along the lines of commerce and ownership, monetary communications. Most of these, of course, fitting under the umbrella of language. Standardized food portions are like standardized three and a half minute music tracks. They are packaged rations of what could otherwise be a continuous supply, unmediated by language and commerce. Listening to canned music is like eating a $40 charcuterie board at a bougie chain restaurant. Playing live interactive music is like those late night visits to the pantry where you can just gorge yourself until you're happy and you don't need to worry about the dish ending and you don't need to worry about how much you're gonna tip and you don't need to worry about people hovering over you explaining your food to you while you're trying to eat. The great thing about the food music comparison and the reason I wanted to end the episode on it is that however much language might be invading the food world as well as every other human endeavor, however much politics and strife and oppression and deception might be surrounding our food practices, when you get food right, I mean when you really get it right, and when it's finally time to eat, like when it's finally time to do the actual eating that all the problems and strife are ultimately all about, you're probably not going to hear a word about those problems. <clears throat> And it's just the same with music. When you really get music right and make it so delicious, none of the problems surrounding the music really come to bear. And nobody really needs to say anything at all. Thanks so much for tuning in to Music is Just a Word. I hope we can connect again when it's time for episode 5. Music by me, of course, except for like three seconds of the guitar playing that came along with the cattle sample. Mm -hmm.
Oh, and of course, thanks to Q Mike McGee for screaming the title. This is James Anderson signing off after another episode of Music is Just a Word.